so welcome to the show and thank you so much for doing this by the way i love the book um it's very technical i think you have like 1500 footnotes i think i heard you say so uh i, I mean you really delve into it it's really great um but just for my my viewers or my listeners can you describe a little bit of your background and credentials and such okay well <clears throat> I got my PhD in 1982 uh, at the University of Chicago in geophysical sciences, researching Arctic weather and climate. And so, you know, following that, I spent, you know, decades in the academic environment, uh, most recently at the Georgia Institute of Technology, where I served as chair of the School of Earth and Atmospheric Sciences for 13 years. Um, 2017, um, I retired from academia, and I'm working full-time with my company, which is Climate Forecast Applications Network, which is a weather and climate services um, company. And over that period, I've had you know, a fairly wild ride, and I've explored a lot of different dimensions of the climate debate, um, everything from not just different subfields, but legal aspects, social psychology, philosophy of science, a science policy interface, and, and so on. And all of those dimen different dimensions were integrated in my book, my new book, Climate Uncertainty and Risk. Now, this was published by an academic press, so it is you know very well documented with a lot of footnotes, but I tried to make it, it's intended for a broad readership. Um, in fact, my publisher and the series I'm in is really targeted at social sciences and humanities, not the hard science. So, you know, anybody with some, you know, college background, you know, college education or in any field or who is otherwise motivated to take a deep dive into the climate issue, my book should be accessible to them. Yeah, I recommend it for like, well, not only just every American, I mean, they should they should hand this book out in schools and high schools, maybe, or colleges at least, and uh, definitely the policymakers. But what I also find so interesting is just, um, you know, like your background, I mean, you, you, you touched on your PhD, but you really started with this topic. I mean, I heard you talking about a story on another podcast where you're saying that you, you fell in love with this topic in fifth grade, that you, you spent your birthday money on a geology book or whatever. <laughs> oh, yeah. And so, I mean, that just proves though, that how much you're invested into this topic like you're not a shill for, I, I think that's what you, you're you're censored because you get accused of being a climate denier and all this stuff and it's like that doesn't and when you do the deep dive into your background and, and it doesn't make any sense you're this is a, a topic you're very passionate about um and yeah i'm not sure passionate is the right word because i'm, I'm deeply invested in trying to understand the earth system, particularly the climate system, but I do my best um, to keep passions and politics out of it. Um, you know, I try to be as objective as I can, as thorough as I can, really looking at all the evidence, um, trying to understand disagreements, where they come from and how they might you know, disagreements, I, I, I view it as a good thing for science because it often spurs you to resolve the dif disagreements and helps you make progress. So personally, I think scientific disagreement is a good thing. Um, it spurs debate, which is a good thing for moving science forward. But in this era of highly politicized science, you know, once a scientific field becomes policy relevant, Certainly public health, COVID, climate, you know, GMOs, gender, you know, all of this kind of stuff. Um, you know, certain political, politically correct perspectives become dominant and they become enforced. And people who challenge those perspectives um, tend to be marginalized at the very least, but even ostracized. Um, and, you know, you, we've seen that in the climate field and the COVID most recently. So it's it's not a healthy place for science. But once I left the University of Environment, now I'm my own boss. You know, I can say whatever I want. I can investigate whatever I want. And, you know, if somebody doesn't like it, well, that's 
they can that's their choice not to like it but i try to be as objective as possible and i'm and to me it's science is more about the process it's not about the result i mean scientific evidence finding this is all provisional i mean most of the papers that were published in the last year won't survive the next 10 years um, with, you know, people have either found them to be wrong or irrelevant or boring. So, you know, when somebody publishes a paper, it's not like it's carved in stone. It's just part of the process. And a big part of the process is challenging um, people's findings and um, arguing about them, debating about them. And this is how science moves forward. So I'm a big fan of the scientific process. I am not wedded to any particular scientific finding or outcome, and I'm certainly not invested in any of the policies or politics that surround this issue. So, um, and that's what's so fascinating to me because you, I, I feel like if people just read the surface, uh, they would think that you're an ultra right QAnon uh, Trump supporter MAGA, and uh, you're not. You're you're actually okay. a moderate in the middle. A more like libertarian independent is from what I understand. Yeah. If you, if you read my book without any context about me, yeah, I mean, you, you would think that this was an extremely reasonable, you would not think right. that there was any reason at all to call me a denier. Um, but, but people get called a denier in the climate space, other academics. I, I know the word denier gets thrown around for politicians and journalists, and I don't mind that. But when the word denier is applied to a scientist, then I really, really object to that. Um, what it, And it's really more about the social aspects. I mean, I got tossed into denier land for <clears throat> criticizing other scientists. And this was the climate gate emails, you know, and, and it revealed a whole bunch of skullduggery where um, People who were, you know, IPCC lead authors were trying to evade Freedom of Information Act requests for their data. They were trying to rig the peer review system. They were violating rules and regulations set out by the IPCC in preparing the IPCC reports. And they generally set out to sabotage anybody who disagreed with them or interfered, you know, with the broader climate narrative as they thought it should be. You know, and I spoke out against that. I said, this is absolutely wrong. We need to be open and transparent. We need to make our data publicly available. We need to be honest about uncertainties. We need to avoid overconfidence on our findings. And finally, we need to be respectful of other people who disagree with us. And, you know, and I thought that was very straightforward, you know, motherhood and apple pie kind of statements. But no, you know, thou shalt not criticize important people. And people try, you know, what are we going to do about Judith Curry? She's very inconvenient. And, you know, after trying a few strategies that didn't work so well, they said, oh, well, we'll just call her a denier. We'll toss her into the denier camp, you know, with all the scientific pranks and the oil company people. And, you know, journalists, every blogs, whatever, just picked up on it. Great, very convenient. So even when I mentioned, you know, in a relatively mainstream media article, it'll be well-known climate denier Judith Curry said that you know, yeah. it just become like a tagline yeah. just because um, a few um, self-important climate scientists were upset that I criticized their unethical behavior. So I became a denier. So it, the people who, you know, people who are scientists who get called deniers, it's really more about the social aspects than about the science. And that's just an absolutely reprehensible um, kind of behavior for scientists. And, and scientists who behave like that, calling people like me a denier, they get awards from the professional society, including communication awards. I mean, Michael Mann being the poster child for um, cashing in on calling people like me a climate denier. Um, you know, it, it's a very bad state of affairs, but, you know, to some extent, you know, I can just ignore it, get on with my work. I don't answer to anybody, my clients um, who hire me to, you know, help better understand their weather or climate-related risks. They, 
they highly value what I have to say and the skills that I bring to the table and the products and scenarios and forecasts that I deliver them. So, you know, people who really have skin in the game, you know, and want some really good information, they'll come to me. People who want to play politics with science, you know, will join the bandwagon and just call me a denier because I'm inconvenient. Yeah. Well, and then, but it also hasn't kind of the right wing hijacked some of your research too. Like It's like they want to simplify it and put it, it there's two ga- categories, either the world is going to end in seven years or climate change is a total hoax, drill ba- baby drill or whatever, right? It's like, there's no, and you're kind of in the middle. You're saying, well, maybe we're exaggerating this a little bit and there's other factors and things. And then people just want to put you on one side or the other. And it's like, <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, you can't, th- th- there's no nuance. You know, yeah. this has become so politicized. There's no nuance in this, you know, debate. Um, that there's a large number of scientists who support what I'm doing and agree with me. But when they do speak out in public, they're very much more circumspect about what they say, and they do not criticize the IPCC or other important scientists. They they know enough to stay away from that third rail, you know, and they get away with it. You know, that there's a lot, you know, like I said, I have 1,500 footnotes in my book where I'm citing you know, publications that generally, you know, support the arguments I'm making. It's not like I'm a voice in the wilderness. You know, that there's a lot of scientists um, doing work that, that supports a similar perspective to mine. And it, it's, and the, the biggest problem is thinking that, you know, making this about the science is not about the science. There's three separate problems. We have extreme weather, we have the slow creep of global warming, then we have energy policy. Okay, the the climatariat has lumped all those things into one, you know, climate change emissions, you know, we get rid of fossil fuels, we'll get rid of um, extreme weather, and, you know, the world will be wonderful. But what we're, I mean, we're seeing what's happened in Europe, particularly Germany, as they try to... uh, transition to wind and solar they've basically destroyed their industry and our and their economy i mean it's really bad i mean this is i mean trying to rapidly transition away from fossil fuels um towards an um a system that is not fit for purpose like wind and solar based electricity system i mean is an absolutely colossal mistake that I hope that this country doesn't go too much further down that road. Um, Several states are being very aggressive. Um, New York is being extremely aggressive. Um, New Jersey is joining in. Of course, California has been going down this road for a long time. Um, There's all sorts of lawsuits in individual states, notably Montana, trying to get them to um, stop producing fossil fuels, stop using fossil fuels. Well, what happens when can't use fossil fuels? It gets really cold there is that they burn wood, okay? Biofuel, you, they call it. I watch a whole documentary about this. They try to, it makes it sound better. Biofuel, but aren't we going to run out of that? Well, not only that, but in the wintertime, you have these big temperature inversions and you get this huge smog that gets trapped in this cold air mass. It's horrible air pollution from burning from wood burning stoves in these very, you know, cold states, you know, Montana, Wyoming, stuff like that. So it's it's bad for the environment. In many ways, it's bad for human health. Um, it's just so many things wrong with it. Again, and I outline all of that in um, chapter 14 of my book. Um, you know, we're, we're not, the, the issue, I mean, I have no particular attachment to fossil fuels. I mean, if we look forward to 2100, I don't think we're going to be burning fossil fuels anymore. Um, We could get to that point. Is that what it's? Yeah, because I think you said. Oh, yeah, 2100. 2100, not 2050, not 2030. 50% wind and solar, right? Yeah, no, I mean, wind and solar will be gone in 2100. They just don't make sense. There'll be some niche (laughs) use of that. And maybe rooftop solar will work. But So then what's the future? Uh, I mean, nuclear power, advanced geothermal, um, and, you know, fusion's a possibility. But I, I think um, generation four nuclear and um, 
advanced geothermal are the two most promising ones right now. There are others that are being researched, but you know, we're talking about 75 years from now. You know, of course, there's going to be some better solutions then. And as we, in you know, it, it it's not just a, that wind and solar don't produce enough electricity, or I mean, it's intermittent, it's asynchronous, it's just not a really good match for anything. And you certainly can't run an industrial economy with wind and solar. So, but but even. The, the bigger issue is the land use and the uh, resources. I mean, I don't know if you've ever been driving down like I-80 across the Western U.S. and you see these enormous, they're trying to transport, you know, one single blade for a wind turbine. You see how enormous these things are. Yeah. Well, then enormous. they break and then they're just, what do they do with it? Not only Okay, not only that they break, but after about 10, 12 years, they re, they lose their efficiencies, so the 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 blades need to replace you know every ten to fifteen years, <laughs> you know, and and all the investment that's been made into uh, wind turbines, you know, in 10, 15 years, it's all going to need to be replaced. And how do you make the wind turbines and these blades? Don't you have well, to mine resources with gas powered vehicles? Well, and not well, well, not yeah. You, you need a whole lot of fossil fuels. <laughs> to to build build and transport these wind turbines. So so it, you know common sense has left the room. Yeah, um, it makes absolutely no sense. And it, you know it's it's just um, propaganda, mass delusion. Um, people aren't thinking. Um, it's become tribal. I mean, people who don't want to think they I'm going to belong to this tribe or that tribe. Yeah. But then you know the the people in the you know if, if you think hard about this you most often end up in the middle. Yeah. You go, this is a really complex. System. It would be nice if either one, either if we could uh, create wind and solar and that could be, that would be nice. Or it would be nice if fossil fuels were totally harmless and we could just do whatever we wanted. I mean, but neither one of those is accurate. Yeah, no. Um, well, fossil fuels are finite. And um, also there's, they happen to be concentrated in, countries that aren't very friendly, you know, in the Middle East, Venezuela, places like that. Although North America, we have, we have more than our share of fossil fuel resources, but, um, you know, it, it engenders geopolitical problems. I mean, all the wars that we fought in the Middle East in the late 20th century were, I mean, if the Middle East <laughs> didn't have oil, I don't think we, the U S yeah. would have been involved in, in the Middle East at all. Right. So, I mean, it, it, and, you know, like I'm no huge fan of fossil fuels, but we sure as heck need them, you know, in the near term and probably for the next five decades. Yeah. And we will slowly transition away to, you know, to better fuel sources that are cleaner, cheaper, more abundant. I mean, it, it'll happen, um, but we're interfering with it right now with all these silly deadlines. You know, net zero by 2030. Um, we don't have time to build nuclear power plants. Let's do wind and solar. I don't know if you've seen... Um, these huge big solar farms that people are putting in and, you know, six months into their, you know, life cycle, they get wiped out by a hailstorm, you know, come on. Um, well, and it sounds like from what I'm learning from your book and uh, interviews is that the people that got screwed the most from this whole thing is, is the continent of Africa. There's all these countries in Africa that didn't have electricity and they were trying to get a power grid so they could have power and they were being turned down from the banks that, because the bank was pressuring, no, we can't build, have any more fossil fuel. We can't have coal plants. But then people are coming in and mining their resources and taking that and using that for the cobalt, for the batteries, for electric cars. And Well, even that they're even taking their fossil, you know, their oil and gas and coal and shipping it to Asia and Africa so that they can burn it. I mean, you know, it's been called... Um, green colonialism, energy apartheid, but it's absolutely unethical. Four billion people in the world, half the world's population, do not have access to grid electricity. And the majority of them are in Africa. I mean, you know, they're farming, you know, they're, you know, it's done with tools, you know, wheelbarrows, you know, and axes and shovels and, you know, and... They're basically living like an Amish lifestyle. And a lot of those people are very well educated. They just, okay, what they need is energy. Yeah. You know, if we just loan them the money, 
so they can build fossil fuel power plants. They There's, there's smart people there, well-educated people there. They can take it and run with it. But they're being held back because of the lack of electricity and fuel for transportation. It's just, it's absolutely insane. Mm -hmm. Absolutely insane. And what, why, why people buy this? I mean, you know, I don't know. I mean, Bill Gates, who was a big proselytizer for global warming, he now gets it, you know, you know, it's been way exaggerated and, you know, we, we need, it's a problem we need to deal with. And he admits he probably has one of the biggest personal carbon footprints on the planet. Um, uh, but people are, you know, people who are smart and who are thinking are starting to get it. And even countries in Europe, as they face the political reality of what this will actually cost in terms of money, land use, loss of industrial capacity, et cetera. I mean, people are voting out those politicians. Like the Netherlands had, I mean, the Netherlands has been very aggressive and they voted out, okay, their leader who was pushing this. And now they've got someone that's hopefully a bit more rational. So I think people are going to, you know, start to vote. I mean, don't mess with people's energy and food. It's not just energy; it's a food supply um, for cow farts and fertilizer and ammonia and nitrates and all of this. Uh, again, I'll go back to the Dutch. I mean, the Dutch that they engineered pretty much every inch of that country, and they produce most of Europe's food. It's this tiny country. Fruits, vegetables, livestock, everything. And they're supposed to get rid of, you know, very quickly, a majority of their livestock. <laughs> okay, well, <laughs> what are people in Europe going to eat? And, and even for vegetables and fruits that are grown in like greenhouse-like structures, no fertilizer, you know, well, things aren't going to grow very well. Um, and, and this is not just the Dutch being stupid, but they're abiding by EU guidelines and the Dutch provide food, a lot of the food for the entire European continent. So, so people are starting to get that this does not make sense. So I think you know, as people bump into the realities of, of unreliable and inadequate electricity that is very expensive, um, and land use issues, I mean, people are just going to revolt. Um, so I think I, I think we've peaked, you know, climate craziness, I think, peaked around 2021, 2022. Well, I do you think, think they'll rebrand it, though? Because explain the history here. Uh, you probably know about this stuff more than I do. But I think in the 70s, they called it the, the fear thing was the Ice Age. And then the 80s, it was acid rain. And then in the 90s, it was ozone layer. And then the 2000s global warming, and now it's climate change. Like, why does it? Why does the thing keep changing? And whatever happened to those old ones? Did we? Was that still a concern? The ozone layer and all that stuff. Um, sort of. Um, the the issue is, and and, the, and this is a lot of this is driven by the UN, the United Nations, and you know they have a a globalist agenda. Um, their goal is, you know, non governmental world control through the UN. I mean, that's their agenda. And they, you know, decades ago, you know, 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, they picked on two topics where they can push it: the environment and health. Okay. And so they saw climate change as the, you know, a, a great vehicle for this. And more recently with COVID, the public health issue has picked up steam where they're trying to get the World Health Organization, you know, to to have to have a national government see their authorities to the World Health Organization in managing pandemics. <laughs> this is what they're trying to get away with. Um, you know, I certainly it seems hope like there's the yeah, there's definitely some hypocrisy there because a lot of these UN meetings that people are flying in on private jets and uh, oh, it's terrible. Um, yeah. So what is that? Because I heard a statistic, the top 1% account for more carbon emissions than the poorest 66%. So what if, oh. uh, what is, I mean, what, how much does a, a private jet, what is the carbon footprint on that? Like what if they banned private jets and everyone had to fly? Uh, I mean, you could still fly first class, but we just got rid of private jets. What would that do for the climate? Well, 
it would certainly go in the right direction. I don't really know what the numbers would be, um, but it, it's just massive hypocrisy. All these um, preachers of doom, you know, flying around in their private jets and, you know, the movie stars, Leonardo DiCaprio and his ginormous yacht. I mean, that's like the size of my neighborhood. Um, you, you know, this is just massive hypocrisy and, and people see that. And part of the problem is, is and, and they're clever, is, is the indoctrination of kids, you know, from kindergarten. You know, so so you've got this whole whatever whatever the Gen Z, I don't even know what the latest generations are, but they're scared to death of global warming. They think they have no future. Think the world's going to end in 2030. All sorts of stupid things that they think they've been. You know, all of the marketing and whatever that is targeted at uh, children and young adults. It's worse even than what we see. Um, it, it's just a bad situation. Um, you know, I you know I do my my thing, but I'm just one little voice, and I'm not a very aggressive one. I mean, I don't court media attention. I don't go out there and travel around and do rallies or anything. I'm it's just you know me and my laptop, you know, and and the occasional podcast <laughs> and my blog and my Twitter account and you know whatever. But there's um, other people. You know, there's a substantial community of highly educated people who are knowledgeable about the climate situation, who are speaking out, who have substacks and um, blogs and Twitter accounts. Um, again, they don't have access to the mainstream media, you know, in the way that Michael Mann and, and the, you know, the bullying alarmist people that the mainstream media seems to like but you know that anybody who wants to find these voices can find these voices um and there's some good books out there of course there's my own book there's a book by steve coonan and bjorn lomborg and roger pilkey jr and michael schellenberger that there's a lot of good books out there writing about different aspects you know, of this whole situation that, and, and I like the books because it allows a single person to put forward a worldview and some arguments. And, and to me, that makes more sense than just a, a scattershot of articles and Twitter accounts and things like that. So personally, I like the books um, as really sort of educating people and motivating them to think more broadly and deeply about these issues. Right. And it's hard to say because it's, there is no exact, we don't know exactly how much damage humans are doing with the fossil, because we don't have a control group. We don't have another earth where nobody's using fossil fuels, right? We just, we've seen an increase since the industrial revolution. So they're kind of tying that too, but it also could be some other natural things too, right? I mean, there's a lot of factors, which. Well, sure. Yeah. We haven't really, I mean, there's no simple way to sort out natural climate variability from human caused climate variability. It's not simple. Um, people use climate models to try to do that, but the climate models aren't fit for purpose. They don't treat natural climate variability correctly. So of course they're going to get the, they're going to overemphasize human caused climate change. So it's, it, so the climate models are not fit for purpose to sort that out. So we don't know. Humans are influencing the climate, not just through fossil fuel emissions, but through their land use, um, for example. Um, cutting down forests, agriculture, urbanization, all this kind of stuff changes the local climate as well. So, I mean, we, we are changing the climate, but the, the, the point is this, say for the, the past hundred years, the climate has warmed about one degree centigrade. And over that hundred years, the population has increased by about four times. Um, a fewer percentage, much smaller percentage of them are living in poverty. Okay, agricultural productivity has gone way up. People, a far smaller percentage by two orders of magnitude lose their lives in extreme weather events. So we've done really well over the last hundred years, and 
the reason that we've done so well over the last hundred years is because of energy and electricity, and we're able to build wealth, and we're able to reduce our vulnerability. We're able to um, figure out ways to increase agricultural productivity. We figured out ways to protect ourselves from extreme weather. So, I mean, we've done really well <laughs> yeah. for the first degree of um, of warming. So why do we think that all of a sudden it's going to be catastrophe if we have another degree of warming over the next 80 years? I mean, it makes absolutely no sense. Um, and and by restricting the energy supply and keeping you know electricity away from the Africans and everything else, um, we're increasing their vulnerability to extreme right. weather. And, you know, we're not helping with poverty and hunger and things that, you There's know, a cost for everything. Yeah. Yeah. The, yeah. Well, exactly. So we're, we're just being really, really stupid, um, you know, in this <laughs> early part of the 21st century. Um, hopefully, um, mid-century, we will have um, come to our senses and figure out how we can, how 8 billion people on the planet can live harmoniously and in cooperation, you know, with our environment and, you know, taking advantage of the ecosystem services, but not over overtaxing the environment. I mean, this is, you know, I'm an old fashioned environmentalist. I care about water pollution, air pollution and soil quality and, you know, that kind of thing. I mean, all this stuff about CO2 and global warming. I mean, it, it's people have lost the plot. I mean, back in the 1970s, I mean, before you were born, I mean, Greenpeace, when Greenpeace got its start, it was about save the whales. Okay, and then and now Greenpeace has done a full 180. Who cares if whales um, are being killed or dying, you know, off the Atlantic coast because of the offshore wind turbines and all the activity and all the infrastructure there? I mean, it's a huge problem. Oh, but it's okay because global warming. Oh um, wow! Oh yeah, that's oh, sad. Yeah. I mean, on and on it goes. I mean, well, it, and it, then explain this to me too because. Um... I saw this article it was really interesting. And it was on like, it was on like multiple sources on New York Post, Wall Street Journal, Washington Post or Washington Examiner. But they talked about uh, the the problem with electric cars is that the batteries are so heavy that it weighs down on the tires. And then you burn more of the tire uh, material, the rubber, and then that goes into the soil. And so it's actually it could be in a way it's worse for the environment. What, what are your thoughts on that? Well, I don't think the the full accounting has been done on electric vehicles, I mean, in terms of the overall impact on the environment. I mean, I think it's an experiment to be done to, you know, to develop electric vehicles and have people use them, try them, evaluate them and whatever. But once you start mandating them, that then you're in a different territory. It's not clear to me that electric vehicles, I mean, let, let's say we're gonna get rid of the um, gasoline powered fuels. It's not clear to me that electric vehicles are a way to go. There may be, you know, synthetic fuels, liquid fuels that we would use or hydrogen or whatever. It's not clear to me that mandating electric vehicles is makes any kind of sense at this point. Um, you know, just let the uh, market play out and invest in developing new alternatives. Like I said, in 2100, I don't think we're going to be burning fossil fuels. I think petroleum is, is a valuable resource. You know, we'll be using it for, you know, materials and whatever else. I don't think we'll be burning it. Um, we will evolve away from that over the course of the 21st century. But trying to kneecap the fossil fuel industry and think that we're going to run an industrial economy and whatever and support 8 billion people on wind and solar is, is a complete joke. It's a complete joke. Do you think it's short-sighted or do you think this is on purpose that we're, they're using this as a, like you said, the UN is the way to control people that, Oh, we're, we're trying to help the environment. Really. They just don't want us to have any power. They want to limit it and have put like carbon taxes on and things like that. Well, um, 
you know, I think there, you know, I hate to say it, I think there is a sort of a colonialism kind of agenda. Um, yeah, it's hard to know. It's hard to know. It, it's when I listen to these UN officials, you know, they're code red and the highway to hell, you know, for another degree centigrade of warming over the 21st century, all this rhetoric that they use is completely unmoored from the science. Um, you got to wonder what's going on. I mean, there's some agenda that has nothing to do with human thriving or the climate or anything else that I can think of. There's some other agenda. And I, you know, it's just like the power, the global non-government world control globalization kind of agenda that's been the UN stamp since the very beginning. Yeah, because China is technically, they're the number one biggest polluter. They're about three times the U.S. even. Uh, we're number two, right? Ah, uh, I'm not sure. I think Europe is ahead of oh, really? the U.S. Oh, okay. Yeah, overall, integral Europe, I think. I'm not sure. Uh, India, no, India is surpassing oh. in emissions at this point. So, you know, the okay. U.S. is like maybe 14% of the global emissions right now. Yeah. Um so, what about the yeah. US military? That that's they're they're up there too. They they the US military has more carbon emissions than some entire countries. That I don't know. I know the US military has been very aggressive at trying to um generate power locally. Um, yeah. makes them vulnerable. So, but I, I don't know what the carbon footprint of It's the just US interesting is. that's that's never discussed the the private jets and the U.S. military, those that's just out of the conversation. Well, it's all about what we can do. Yeah. Air travel is not as far from the biggest source, you know, of CO2 emissions. Right. It's right. agriculture, right? That's another thing. And, and that's agriculture is a big one. Food, and industry. Right? Yeah. yeah. Agriculture is a big one. Industry is a big one. Electricity. But transportation isn't that big. And then jet transportation is only a subset of that so that's not a big driver i mean it's important but it's not not a big driver and uh, what about you we talked about food a little bit which one uh which diet is better for the climate because i've heard conflicting things i've heard oh you need to eat vegan it's better for the planet and then i've heard other people say no you need to eat meat that's more natural that's better th for the environment um, I, th I think people are going to eat what they want and, and um, if, if they're going to be, you know, and, and we should figure out how to accommodate that um, different, you know, for, for example, um, I have celiac disease. I have, you know, trouble with wheat and a lot of other grains and meats. One of the things that I digest very easily. Hmm. Okay. And, you know, all these impossible burgers and whatever, there's no way I could ever Put one of those into my digestive system i would get really really sick mm -hmm. um you know so meat is healthy um is a healthy food um so you know vegetation so i i think we should just let um people you know you know people eat what they want to eat and and have agriculture local agricultural systems that support that um that said we can you know, far more efficiently and and environmentally and and whatever. And there's lots of you know best practices that are being developed that um, perhaps could be better communicated to global farmers. Um, so it, it's really you know like more environmentally conscious agriculture. I think that would be good rather than getting rid of certain food options. Yeah. Uh, because some of the, it's, I just think it's interesting because I've heard like vegan is better, but then I've also heard that it takes a lot of water for even just like one almond. It's like something like ridiculous. Oh, oh yeah. Almonds are, yeah, almonds are very water intensive. So, um, and then people are drinking almond milk, which is the, and so like how much water are we using for like, like a glass of almond milk? Like how much, how much water did it take to make that? I don't know. It's interesting to think about. Yeah, for sure. Um, so, my point is, is I think, you know, lose the mandates, you know, put these things back into local control and let, you know, local governments and regions and companies, whatever, figure out how to secure their common interests, you know, in terms of their environment and their food supply and their energy supply and, um, 
you know, do things that make sense for them rather than trying to figure out how to respond to these top-down mandates from the UN about energy, food, and whatever. I mean, because they're 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 weakly justified, and a top-down approach almost never makes sense when you're talking about you know a global scale. So we just need to get over that sort of global approach and try to look look at bottom up approaches for dealing with our problems and challenges and opportunities. And, you know, once you start looking at human sized problems in a particular state, community, country, whatever, very easy to get people to identify the problems, I mean, and sort through the possible solutions and then get behind the ones that make the most sense. I mean, you can manage to improve things, you know, when you're cut things up into human-sized, bite-sized problems rather than trying to change the composition of the global atmosphere or whatever we have going on with these crazy UN policies. Yeah, because that's one thing that I, I think that I would hope that people could agree on is that we really can't control the climate. I mean, we can influence it a little bit, but we don't have, I mean, ultimately, like, something crazy could happen. I mean, you look at the history and we don't know what's coming for. I think that's what my point was about the, you know, the ice age, the Ozo, there's always something like they're trying to predict. And then I think that even in that Al Gore movie, he said, Oh, the, the these things are going to be, it's going to be over in seven years. We only have seven years. It's always like we have this many years and I don't know where, where do they come up with these numbers? Um, well, they pull them out of thin air pretty much. Um, they, they, they try to figure out, you know, how can we apply maximum political pressure? If you put something off too far in the future, um, people will ignore it. If you make it to, oh no, we have to completely change everything tomorrow, people say that's impossible. So they're looking for, you know, the sweet spot that will apply maximum political pressure. I mean, that's the game they're playing. Yeah. I mean, so in your book, I mean, you talk about the risks and like, I mean, there's so much about risk assessment and like the, the pluses in my, I mean, you really analyze this down. I, I really like that approach because it's so realistic. What is, I mean, so if the, if the people were right that are saying that, you know, the world's going to end, like, what is the worst case scenario? Like, how does this end the world and how soon is, is that even possible that it would, the world would just literally well, in end? In terms of just CO2 emissions, I mean, That, that's not going to cause anything bad. It's just a slow creep of warming and the uh, oceanic and land carbon sinks will slowly adjust over time and you know we'll have some equilibriums and whatever and we'll adapt so that there's no huge issue associated with the slow creep of CO2 warming. Um, could something really bad happen on the time scale of 100 or 200 years? Well, maybe. Um, the collapse of the West Antarctic ice sheet, which is very unstable, and there's lots of under ice volcanoes. I mean, people are trying to blame, uh, blame every iceberg that leaves the West Antarctic ice sheet on global warming. Well, no, it's a very dynamic ice sheet, and uh, there's lots of under ice volcanoes. It's just unstable. I mean, if that were to start to collapse, we, we would see, you know, some pretty significant sea level rise over a course of a few centuries. That's probably the worst that we would see, you know, happening, you know, an asteroid striking the earth. I mean, that would be a big deal, but, but, you know, certain bad things could happen, but fossil fueled warming, you know, just really is not one of them, particularly, you know, the time scale of the 21st century. Yeah. So you mentioned the volcanoes um, and I think you just touched on this briefly in the book, but explain this uh, concept of volcanic of volcanic cooling that actually the planet might be cooled by some of these volcanoes or I, I, maybe I didn't understand that right. Okay. Well, back in the early 1800s, there were three explosive volcanic eruptions. One of them was called Tambora. I don't recall the name of name of the other two and you know, explosive volcanoes. And, you know, that this caused, you know, there was a year without a summer I think following one of those volcanoes, I mean, it was just really bad. And there was cooling, you know, for a couple of decades because of these volcanic eruptions. 
Uh, more recently, the Hunga Tonga volcano, this is the one that erupted, I think, in 2022, you know, right in the tropical, you know, near the Philippines, whatever. And this was an underwater volcano, and it spewed a bunch of water into the troposphere. And unlike most volcanoes, by spewing water vapor, okay, into the into the stratosphere, I mean, this is actually having a small global warming effect. So some of the warming that we've seen in the last year or so has been associated with the Hunga Tonga volcano. So there's lots of external things that can go on. The um, large-scale ocean circulation um, systems evolve and oscillate and shift. I mean, th those can cause big changes to regional climates and our weather. So there's all sorts of natural variability that goes on that isn't properly accounted for in, um, say, predicting how the climate might play out in the 21st century and, and blaming extreme weather events on fossil fueled warming is a complete joke because the the weather, there's no trends, even apart from heat waves, there's no trends in hurricanes or floods or droughts or anything like that. And the IPCC, the UN assessment reports even acknowledge that, but that doesn't stop um, journalists, advocate, you know, activists, and even some scientists from blaming every extreme weather event on fossil fueled warming. And that's a complete joke. If, if you just look at the U.S., um, the weather was far and away worse in the 1930s than anything we've seen in the 21st century. We had the worst heat waves by far, the worst droughts, the worst forest fires, even the worst U.S. landfalling hurricanes occurred in the 1930s. And this is, you know, well before the fossil fueled warming began. So trying to tie extreme weather events to um, fossil fueled warming is scientifically unjustified. Yeah, I think you say that in the book that catast what is it catast catastrophe narrative is not supported by mainstream science. So I mean, yeah, you can look at that, but it's like it seems very unlikely or impossible. Yeah, implausible. I guess is the word I mostly use. Never say impossible, but certainly yeah. impossible. Yeah. Um, so. You know, the objective of my book is to, you know, for people just to broaden the way they think about this whole issue, you know, both the science right. and also the policy solutions and, you know, and try to step back and, you know, figure out, you know, how to, how can 8 billion people, you know, best live on this planet in terms of um supporting human well-being, thriving and flourishing. I mean, that should be the goal. And we know that we can't thrive if we totally trash the environment. So yeah. we have to seek some sort of balance. And it's not just the people, it's the uh, the animals too. I mean, you talk about this where warming isn't the only problem. It's the land use and the deforesta deforestation resulting in habitat destruction, loss of species, overfishing, polluting the air, water, and soil from these agrochemicals. And I mean, there's all sorts of stuff that, that we don't really talk about that as much. I know we, we, we've sort of traditional environmentalism has been lost and that's not a good thing. We need to go back to that um, and stop worrying about CO2 so much. Yeah. Cause that's only one piece of it. And uh, I mean, the soil thing is interesting too, cause now I'm hearing all these things like people that uh, you said you had celiac disease uh, and I've heard things like people go to Europe and they can eat bread there because of the way it's farmed or something. And then there's people that are now here in America going on like the carnivore diet and they're being cured of all these autoimmune disorders. And it's something to do. Uh, the theory is maybe that there's something in the fruits and vegetables and the plants here that with the soil that is, is harming them and, and, and those uh, uh, agrochemicals or whatever they're called, the fertilizers and things. Well, to, to a certain extent, um, but some of it's just different, like the cows produce milk with different strain of casein protein that I can drink milk in Europe. I can't drink milk in the U.S. from U.S. cows. So um, that there are just certain genetic differences that have evolved um, between the two continents. And, um, you know, some of it relates to soil health and um, 
pesticides and processing and whatever else. So, um, yeah, a lot of the things that we do to the food supply um, does not really support human health. You know, a lot of over-processing and this, that, and the other. And, um, you know, I think you can't feed 8 billion people without industrial scale farming. So the people who just promote very small farming, I mean, that certainly can't cut it by itself. I mean, smallholder farmers in Africa and Asia, they produce, I don't know, maybe a third of the world's food. Um, you know, these are people living right on the edge of poverty. And my company actually works um with other companies who are trying to other organizations who are trying to help the smallholder farmers um, reduce their vulnerability with better weather forecasts, um, having water tanks to tide them over, you know, when the rains aren't falling, you know, and, and lots of other kind of simple things to help make the smallholder farmers the existence easier and make them more profitable it's a big challenge because a big fraction of the that's that's where a big fraction of the world's uh food does come from in africa and south asia so you know we need to figure out how we can help them um, on the other side then we have big scale and in, industrial farming and you know some of those practices you know aren't very good but they could be improved um but yeah yeah there's lots of there's lots of room for improving agricultural practices and if you and if those people have enough fertilizer and enough energy and electricity then they can you know do better with the food supply if yeah. you start hampering all that then we're really going to mess up the global food supply because it seems too, that if people didn't have to travel, the food didn't have to travel as far, then that could burn less fossil fuel. If we had, you know, if I just the farm is down the street from my house, that's a lot, a uh, lot less travel for the and fossil fuels burning for the the food to get to me. Uh, then it seems that should be the case, but it isn't always the case. That yeah, it's it's not quite that simple. A lot oh. of times, more efficient, energy wise, and whatever. If there is food transportation, but it's not obvious. Yeah. Well, we talked about the volcano. Um, explain this one to the solar variations. I found this very interesting. And this was kind of, this model says that there, we might actually hit a cooling period instead of a warming period that that natural cooling would, would is predicted possibly. Okay. Well, there's a lot of debate and uncertainty in the solar community, even about what went on in the second half of the 20th century. Um, because the observer, you know, the satellite coverage was discontinuous and so on. So, so there's debate, but it's generally agreed that we did have a grand solar maximum in the late 20th century, and that you know things are relatively less intense um, as we enter the 21st century. Whether we're headed towards a significant minimum in the mid 21st century or just, you know, a century scale minimum, you know, it's hard to know. But the point that I raise is that we really don't know how to predict what the sun is going to do. And we don't adequately treat um, indirect solar effects in the climate models. So the, the simplistic idea that the sun doesn't have very much impact on the Earth's climate, I think, is wrong. Um, and we're not adequately accounting for all the different complex ways that the sun interacts with the climate. So it's just one of those unknowns that I think we should be paying more attention to. Yeah. Well, and then the sea level thing, you talk about that. The prediction is that the sea levels are going to rise and it's going to be dangerous. So I, I guess, again, this just goes back to this hypocrisy. And I, I just don't understand why are all these rich people building their houses right on the water? If I mean, this is like if the doctor says, you know what, you have cancer and then you go out and smoke a pack of cigarettes. Right. I mean, I just don't understand if this is such a dire thing. Why are they flying jet jets and building their houses on the water if it's going to end, if the world's going to end? Um, yeah, President Obama. 
<laughs> okay. Has this big house on the in Martha Vineyards right on the coast. And I think he has a 5,000 gallon propane tank for backup fuel in case the power goes out. Okay. Um, you know, that's, uh, I think, a pretty clear case of climate hypocrisy um, by storing all of that fossil fuel on your property and living on the coast. Um, but yeah, no, I mean, the slow creep of sea level rise really is a slow creep. And um, our coastal engineering and getting rid of uh, mangrove swamps and all of this kind of stuff has really had a bigger impact on you know local sea level issues and also landfills trying to do landfills like like the um, San Francisco airport is built on landfill and it's sinking okay and and so the they sort of have a a sea level problem but blaming it on fossil fuels is a joke it's really that the airport's sinking not that not that the ocean's rising over there um yeah there's a whole lot of complex processes in play you know ocean circulation patterns and and sinking that there's a lot of subsidence um, in the mid atlantic states from withdrawal of um groundwater and that makes the, the land sink and louisiana withdrawal of groundwater and also fossil fuel extraction. So the sinking of New Orleans and the nearby regions, a lot of it is just driven by local sinking and also by the engineering of the Mississippi River that keeps the Delta from being replenished. So there's a lot of what humans have done yeah. that have brought the excessive local sea level rise in um yeah. New Orleans. And it's really more related to what humans have done to the right. environment. The misplaced blame, as you talk about in chapter 13, with the uh, like the things that they reroute the rivers and, and then the lakes dry up and like, oh, it's climate change. It's like, well, no, you rerouted the water out of there. So and this is the issue. When you blame everything on climate change, it gives you an excuse mm. for not dealing with your real problems mm -hmm. in a rational way. You just throw up your hands, oh, climate change. Yeah. You know? Act of God, we can't do anything about it other than stopping burning fossil fuels. But it it just gives policymakers an out for well, not dealing yeah. with the real sources of their problems. And it's kind of an interesting experiment, right? Because uh, I'm in Arizona, you're in Nevada, but like if you look at like a state like California that's really enforcing a lot of this stuff, I, I've heard that they have a lot of like rolling blackouts because of all these policies and and their. Um, I think they're closing down power plants or they're not building enough new ones and they're having a lot of new people come in. And so they're having issues. So I don't know if that, I mean, if that's going to be an example of that, the whole country is going to have the rolling blackouts. I don't think that's a good thing. Well, yeah, the electricity, yeah. premature, you know, shutting down nuclear power plants is the stupidest thing that you can do. An existing power plant that has no CO2 emissions that, the investment has already been made in, but they're shutting down nuclear power plants all over the place because they think they're somehow bad. They're not. They don't emit any fossil fuels. I mean, any carbon dioxide emissions or whatever. And they're shutting them down thinking it's the right thing to do for the environment. It's completely insane. And people are left with not enough power. Um, yeah, like New York shutting down uh, nuclear power plants and going wind and solar in a big way. And there was like a big, a year ago Christmas, there was an extreme cold event in the mid-Atlantic states. And New Jersey was particularly hard hit. And and they didn't have, you know, enough electricity. You know, they, they were caught way short, way short, you know, no wind, no solar, gas lines freezing, everything else. The only thing that bail, bailed them out is um, nuclear power transmitted from Illinois. Mm -hmm. Okay, a lot of nuclear power in Illinois, but Governor Pritzker of Illinois wants to stop, wants to get rid of the nuclear power and prevent more building of nuclear power. Um, fortunately, I think the... Illinois Congress overrode his veto so that they can still build nuclear in Illinois. I mean, 
what is the point of that? I just don't get it. If you want to get rid of a coal power plant, okay, well, you can make an argument for that in terms of air pollution and CO2 emissions. But getting rid of a nuclear power plant makes no sense. Yeah. Is it just a fear of the risk if a, if a meltdown happens? That that's, that's the biggest catastrophe that they would be worried of. But the nuclear powers, power plants are more safe than any other power plant. That's safer than wind, solar, or gas, whatever. There have been no lives lost. Um, they, they are completely, never say completely, but 99.999%, you know, fail safe in terms of a meltdown, even like really old, badly built um, nuclear power plants like Chernobyl, you know, had sort of a meltdown, but with relatively minor impacts. I mean, <laughs> you know, um, so, so this is, yeah, especially if they build it kind of in the middle of nowhere, if something does happen. Yeah, it's, just, it's the safest power supply we have is nuclear power. So, I mean, yeah. trying to make this out into some horrible bogeyman is just totally unjustified by. It's just not. Yeah, because I like you said, I don't think it's realistic that we could rely on wind and solar. Now, the yeah, the nuclear and the, the what do you call it? Geothermal. That, that's the that could that's advanced be geothermal. Yeah. 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 Okay. Great. What else? Is there anything else that we can do as as citizens? Uh, maybe just have these discussions and and bring a, a awareness yeah. to this issue. Well, the, the the biggest thing, and I think you have a younger audience here, is have people live their best lives and just don't freak out about the climate change problem. Climate change is a very slow thing, and um, do what makes sense. Okay. For you. Personally, for your community, don't buy an electric vehicle unless you really like the technology. If you think it's going to save the planet, don't waste your time. But if you like the technology, go for it. Well, that's because um, cool. yeah, I have a gas car, so but I don't drive it very much. I I, mo I mostly work from home, so I think my carbon footprint yeah. is okay. I hope. <laughs> yeah, yeah, huh. um, yeah. So so the, this problem, this whole issue, has been way overinflated. And we just need to, people just need to get on with their lives and um, live their best lives, try to, you know, not be totally awful to the environment, you know, do the best you can. And, you know, just wait for research and development and new companies and entrepreneurship and government investment in newer, more abundant, cheaper, cleaner technologies. And if we don't get in the way, that would happen over the course of the 21st century, you know, in the normal course of events. All right. Well, I hope so. Thank you so much for doing this. And people can uh, check out your blog. Your book is available now. I listen to it on Audible. So you can just fly right through it if you do double speed. And uh, anything else you want to promote? Um, okay. My blog is um, climate, etc. JudithCurry.com. I'm on Twitter at Curry J A. And my book is Climate Uncertainty and Risk. Okay. Great. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you. I enjoyed talking with you. You too. All right. Have a good one. Bye.